All right, hello everybody. Welcome, welcome to the live uh, Deep Sky Tour. Uh, my name is Stephen Hummel. I am the Dark Sky Specialist for McDonald Observatory. Uh, that means essentially I try to keep the sky dark. Uh, and so uh, now that the sun has set, we do indeed have very dark, perfectly clear skies tonight. Fantastic conditions for you. I'm really excited. Uh, so uh, before I get to, uh, too carried away, uh, if you have any questions for me during the program, uh, we do have two moderators in the chat who'd be happy to answer uh, any of the questions you may have. And I'll also be taking more questions uh, towards the end of the program. Uh, if something takes too long to type out or some more detailed question, uh, I will take it uh, and chat about it here towards the end of the program. But I hope to be showing you a few different things in the night sky right now. First, I want to talk a little bit about where exactly I am. Uh, so if you're not familiar with McDonald Observatory, uh, we are a research facility of the University of Texas at Austin, uh, but we are not in Austin at all. We are far west Texas, uh, and way out in the desert. Uh, and uh, there's a picture of us in the daytime. Uh, we have three major telescopes. Uh, the, the one in the foreground is our largest. That's our Hobby Eberly telescope. Uh, it's currently the largest op telescope in the world that's operational. Uh, usually it's one of the largest telescopes, but uh, we are still open and doing research. Uh, we are closed to the public, uh, but we are still doing research in these times. And, and that can't be said about a lot of observatories, but, uh, but we do have uh, maintaining, you know, social distancing and such, but we are still doing research. Uh, but uh, again, there's three major telescopes. Uh, these are not the ones I'm going to be using, though, tonight, uh, because those large telescopes may be nice, uh, but they're not the be best for taking pretty pictures, which is essentially our goal tonight. Uh, instead, I'm using a telescope located down at our visitor's center, and uh, if you've never visited McDonald Observatory, uh, when we do eventually reopen, uh, we're not sure when that will be, but when we do, we highly encourage you uh, to come and visit us. And at our visitor center, we have several more telescopes in these smaller domes. Uh, the one with the arrow pointed to it is uh, where I am right now. That's the dome I'm located in. And uh, it's a 16-inch telescope, which means the mirror on this telescope uh, behind me is 16 inches across. Uh, now, of course, it, the video you're seeing is all red and grainy because I need to keep it dark in the dome. Uh, it has to be very dark uh, in order for us to not wash out our view of the object in the telescope. Uh, so that's why it's kind of red. kind of sets the mood, I guess, a little eerie. Uh, but uh, what's, let's talk a little bit about this telescope. Uh, this telescope, again, it's 16 inches across in the diameter. That's 0.4 meters if you prefer a metric. And uh, that is essentially its light gathering area. Uh, now, a professional astronomer would consider this telescope to be a little bit on the small side. We do have larger ones here, uh, but this is certainly bigger than what most amateur astronomers have. And this is a research grade telescope. It is uh, very high quality optics. Uh, now, if you come here to visit, you would look through this telescope as well as several others with your own eye, with an eyepiece, uh, at several different things during our star parties, which we have uh, uh, three times a week when we're open. Uh, but, uh, of course, you can't look through it now, right? They can't stream your eyeball through the internet, so I've attached a camera. Uh, now, cameras don't work like our eyes do. That doesn't really sound like a bold statement, uh, but... Uh, well, cameras uh, have some disadvantages and advantages. Our eyes are pretty good at seeing in the dark, given how wide they are. Uh, they're actually very sensitive. Uh, so a camera may not be as sensitive, you know, pound for pound, uh, but they can have the shutter open for a very long time, accumulating light and thus getting more light over time than our eyes would see in a moment. Uh, and so I'm going to be taking two exposures of each target, uh, or at least at least two. Uh, one will be an exposure that's relatively short, two to five seconds or so. And the first one is designed to give you a sense of what the object we're looking at actually looks like with your human eye if you were to just simply look through the telescope with an eyepiece. So a more realistic view. And it's a black and white camera as well, because our eyes don't see color at night. Our, our nighttime vision is essentially black and white. It's also more realistic there as well. And then after I show you what it kind of looks like through the telescope in real life, I'll take another longer exposure, 
uh, 10, 15 seconds up to a minute or so uh, to really show you wh essentially what the telescope and the camera can do and reveal the whole structure of the object we're looking at. And again, we titled this the, the Deep Sky Tour. And uh, when, when we're talking about a deep sky object, we're, th we're talking about things that are very far away, often in space, uh, far beyond the reaches of our, our solar system, the planets and the sun and the moon are. We're looking way out beyond that. And the first uh, deep sky object we're going to look at tonight is probably one of the most famous in the sky, and it's known as the Orion Nebula. And the Orion Nebula is located within the constellation of Orion. I know, really, really surprising there. Uh, but the Orion Nebula, uh, here's the constellation of, of Orion. He's a hunter, he's holding a bow. It's located just below Orion's belt uh, in an area that's sometimes referred as Orion's sword. So right in there, in that little spot, is uh, M42, also known as the Orion Nebula, or Messier 42. Uh, and so I've got the telescope aimed at that right now. And uh, what's gonna, we're going to switch over now to the live view from the telescope. And there we go. So that's what the telescope is seeing right now. And uh, the Orion Nebula is, well, it's a nebula. And a nebula basically just means cloud. It's a fancy term for cloud. And there are lots of cloudy things in space. They come out all kinds of shapes and sizes uh, and are made of different things. But regardless of what it really is and how it got there, if it's cloudy looking and it's in space, astronomers call it a nebula. So it's kind of a nebulous term in astronomy, in other words. You know, but, um, uh, but this particular nebula is actively forming stars. Uh, and you can see that this image is refreshing, by the way. If you look up uh, into your uh, the upper corner, you'll see a little bar. You'll see this picture is it refreshing every three seconds. So it's a live view of this of this object. Uh, so again, it's a big cloud of mostly hydrogen in this particular case. And gravity is bringing this cloud together. And then it contracts in the center. And eventually, if, if there's enough that gets drawn in, the pressures at the center of this dense cloud are enough for nuclear fusion to begin. And that's really how stars are formed. Uh, so it's like a big stellar nursery. And these stars right here in the center are very bright and very young stars. Uh, so they're emitting lots of heat and energy upon the surrounding cloud uh, and making it glow from their heat and energy. So most of the light we're actually seeing is the cloud itself emitting the light. Some of it is reflected uh, for the dust and gas reflecting the starlight. Uh, but this cloud of gas, the Orion Nebula, is located about 1,350 light years away. 1,350 light years. If you aren't familiar with a uh, light year, uh, a light year is a unit of distance, not time. It's the distance light travels in one year. It's one light year. Uh, that distance is uh, 5.88 trillion miles. That's the distance light travels in one year. It took 1,350 years for the light from this object to reach us. All right, so when you look in the telescope, this is roughly what it looks like. Now I'm going to take a longer exposure, and it's going to take a while for it to refresh, but I'm going to expose for 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Uh, now, and that's going to bring out a lot more detail on this object to so show you its full extent. Uh, so it's going to take a little while for that exposure to go. You can see it loading up there uh, in the upper left corner. Uh, but again, this is a, a big cloud of gas and dust, and all stars are born in big clouds of gas and dust like this one. Uh, however, over time, the gas and dust clears off, and it's just the stars left behind. The next object we'll look at will be an example of that. All right, so now you can see the full structure of the Orion Nebula a little better. Uh, it's very bright at the core. But you can see that it extends off away uh, from it as well, like large wings stretching off on either side. Uh, so very dramatic, very photogenic object. Uh, really uh, a fantastic object to look at in, in any telescope, no matter the size. Uh, you will see something interesting uh, with or without a camera. Uh, so 
Uh, I do have an animation that kind of explains this object too, uh, because this object, it, it's easy to forget, it's a three-dimensional thing. So, so the Orion Nebula uh, is in fact a giant cloud of gas and dust, right? Uh, but the stars that are illuminating it are kind of nestled inside of it. So it's almost a bowl-shaped cloud I'm here in this, this animation kind of explaining that. So the stars at the center are emitting all that heat and radiation, illuminating the cloud, and also pushing and sweeping it back, kind of sculpting it in the process. And it just happens that the side in which it's kind of pushed the gas through uh, is facing us. So uh, it's kind of carved out uh, a hole that happens to be facing the Earth. Uh, and so we're peering down into that almost cavern-like uh, feature uh, in space. So again, it's easy to forget that these objects are, are truly, uh, truly three-dimensional. All right. All right, so that's our first deep sky object. Again, that's a star-forming region, kind of the start of a star's life. And the next object we're going to look at uh, is kind of the next stage. It's what's known as an open cluster. And this one is known as Messier 46, M46, uh, whereas the last one was M42. Uh, and it is located um, kind of off a little, 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 uh, not too far from the Orion Nebula, um, but it is located uh, currently in the south. Oh, there we go. Uh, near the constellation of Canis Major down here, the big dog. Uh, this star is Sirius. It's the brightest star in the sky. So kind of off above it, within the band of the Milky Way, the wintertime Mil Milky Way in the sky, uh, right over there. Uh, so now I'm going to move the telescope over uh, to M46, and you'll see it move behind me here. So I'm going to command the telescope to move. Now, of course, if I don't move the dome above my head as well, I'm going to be looking at the wall. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to walk over and spin the dome around to align the opening with the telescope. All right, so now we have the dome and the telescope aligned so we're not staring um, at the wall. Uh, so give me a quick moment to get set up here. Uh, but yeah, so this again is an, o an example of an open cluster of stars, which means it's a whole bunch of stars, like a big stellar family. And let's check out what the telescope is seeing here. So we've got a bunch of stars, right? And uh, it's, again, all stars form in those big clouds of gas and dust, like the Orion Nebula. Uh, and so eventually the cloud clears off. It's either absorbed within the star or it's blown away and disperses. Now what's left behind is now the naked stars, which is what we're seeing here. And we would call that uh, essentially an open star cluster. Uh, we'll see the, uh, a globular star cluster, which is kind of the opposite later on. Uh, so we, we say this is an open cluster because these stars are, uh, they're generally in the same place, they're kind of a big stellar family and all, uh, but they will disperse over time. You know, kind of like real families, uh, they grow up and they lose contact with each other after a while. Not, not drifting too far, but, the, but they will eventually not be together in a group uh, forever. And these are kind of teenage stars in a way. Uh, that's an astronomical uh, uh, terms. Uh, so young for a star in this case is about 250 million years uh, these stars are on average about 250 million years old again that's young for a star uh, some stars can live much longer than that billions of years for example our sun the closest star is 4.58 billion years old with a b uh, these are only 250 million uh, but uh, this is roughly kind of what it looks like in the telescope. But if, if you're observant, you may have noticed uh, that there is sort of a thing in the way. There's, a, there's like a ghostly little donut there. Now let's increase the exposure time a little more. It's gonna, let's go for 11 and a half seconds and it'll load up there. Uh, so again, this is like a stellar family. All these stars. And this cluster is roughly 5,400 light years away. Uh, but there's this other thing here. 
kind of photo bombing it actually. Uh, this is known as NGC 2438. Uh, that's not a name that is very memorable. Uh, but what that is is actually an object that's in the foreground, in between us and that open cluster. So again, that most of the stars are 5,400 light years away. However, this guy, this little ring shape thing, that's another nebula, uh, is about 3,000 light years away. And so it's much closer, even though it just looks like it's part of the cluster, it's really not, it's, it's actually uh, in, the, in the foreground. Uh, and what that is, is essentially uh, kind of the, the ghostly remains of a, of a once, uh, a star that was once like our sun. Uh, so stars, when they age, uh, they get really big, uh, they, they expand and they begin to cool off a little bit, and then they blow off their outer layers into space. It's not an explosion, uh, but you wouldn't want to be close to it either. Uh, we, would, we call this process forming a planetary nebula. That's what we call that little, little donut shape. This is an example of a planetary nebula. And I, I have an animation of that. Uh, so, yeah, stars, when they age, when they get near the ends of their lives, they puff out and blow off their outer layers and shells over time, casting that out into space and kind of forming this vague cloud of, of gas and debris. And the heat of that dying little star at the center uh, energizes the cloud and makes it glow. Uh, so, essentially, this is forming a shell of material that's slowly expanding off, being heated up by that dying little star, uh, and that's causing this this formation we see here. Um, so again, that's sort of the, uh, the the ghostly remains, or almost a grave marker of a star that was once similar to our sun. Uh, so when our sun eventually dies, it may form something somewhat similar to this uh, in over five billion years. So don't worry about it. Don't lose any sleep over that. So. Yeah, so again, this is a dead star, essentially, and these are relatively young stars. So we have a nice little comparison. We've got, uh, we've, we saw where stars are born. We saw a group of young stars. Our sun's a good example of a kind of a middle-aged star. And then uh, most stars will end their lives forming little, little puffballs of gas like you see here. Uh, all right, so let's, let's uh, move on now to something uh, very different. Uh, so what we're going to see next is instead of just a group of stars or where stars are forming, we're going to see an entire galaxy. So we live in a galaxy, right? We live in the Milky Way. So everything you see, or nearly everything you see in the sky when you look up at night, is all part of the Milky Way galaxy. Now when people say the Milky Way, they often are referring to the particularly visible part of our galaxy, which we see as that glowing band across the sky, but all the stars are all part of it too. We're just inside our Milky Way galaxy, so it's hard for us uh, to really appreciate uh, where we are. But uh, the scale of everything becomes uh, a little more comprehensible when we look at another entirely separate galaxy. And the, the galaxy we're going to look at next is known as Messier 81, M81. And so it is located in the north, uh, kind of 180 degrees from where we're looking right now. And so I will show you where that is here in just a quick moment. I, you can see the telescope moving behind me, uh, slewing over to the far north. I'm going to start moving the dome. It's going to take a, a minute or two for the dome to catch up. And this particular object, Messier 81, this galaxy, happens to lie in a very famous constellation, uh, but most people know as the Big Dipper, but is officially known as uh, Ursa Major, the Big Bear. So this is, in fact, Ursa Major here. And there is where M81 lies. It takes a while for the dome to spin and catch up. And there we go.
All right. Now this object is much further away than everything else uh, we've seen tonight. Uh, it is located almost 12 million light years away. So again, almost 12 million years for the light from this galaxy to reach us. So when I say galaxy, I mean it's a giant collection of, of billions of stars. Our Milky Way contains roughly 100 billion stars and is about 100,000 light years across in diameter for most of it. Uh, this galaxy is 100, uh, almost 100,000, about 94,000 light years in diameter. So it's enormous. It took 94,000 years just for the light to travel from one side of it to the other. But it's located almost 12 million light years away. So just kind of think about that. Uh, 12 million years just for the light to reach us. We'll see what the telescope sees. All right, so at first, this is a quick, uh, about a one second exposure. And you can see that there's a little faint fuzz there. Uh, it looks a little bit better than that uh, with the human eye. So let's increase this to about seven seconds of exposure. And this will pretty closely match what the telescope sees, uh, what you see through the telescope uh, with the human eye. And so it looks it looks kind of like that, really. It's it's not as as dramatic through the telescope uh, as maybe some pretty pictures you've seen online, which are hours of exposures. Uh, but with with the human eye, it looks like well a faint fuzzy thing. And in fact, a lot of amateur astronomers uh, call this you know objects like this faint fuzzies. But let's take a longer exposure. Let's let's go for about. Uh, about two minutes, two entire minutes of exposure, and you're, we're going to bring out a lot more detail. Because this galaxy is loaded with all kinds of interesting things. Uh, it is an example of a spiral galaxy, uh, somewhat uh, similar to our own Milky Way. Uh, but this particular spiral galaxy has two, two big arms, uh, whereas other spirals have many smaller arms and are all very very uh, uh, compact. Uh, this one has two rather enormous spiral arms. And galaxies, uh, not all galaxies are spirals. Sometimes they're just kind of big, hazy blobs, sort of, sort of looking like we see here, even under a very long exposure. Uh, and some of them uh, have spirals that are very tightly wound, some of them very loosely wound, more like this one. Um, but uh, the spiral shape comes from how the galaxy is spinning. Uh, but it's actually... Uh, it is, although it is spinning, the stars are moving through the spiral arms. And the spiral, what we see, and we'll see here uh, shortly, is almost like a traffic jam of stars, where, uh, where gravity and thing has created an area of higher density where there's more stars. And kind of like when you're on, on a highway, you're driving down the freeway, and there maybe was an accident several hours ago or minutes ago. Uh, and the accident has since cleared, but everyone still slows down and bunches up and then co keeps going again. Uh, that's, that's essentially what's happening with the stars and the spiral arms. The stars go right through the spiral arms if given enough time, uh, but the traffic jam forms the patterns. All right, so just uh, 20 more seconds here. You can see it loading on the left, and we'll get that two-minute exposure. And we'll see, we'll see essentially what I'm talking about with the spiral arms uh, here in just a quick moment. So again, it's 12 million light years. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Things are always better if you wait for them. There we go. Uh, and you can see it looks very different compared to what it looked like before. Uh, and you can definitely see uh, those arms I was talking about, like almost an S shape to it. Uh, so we have the most stars at the core. So it's, of course, very bright at the center. And we have two enormous arms expanding off of them. But also note that there's like a darker line here. And I can actually adjust it, make a little, little more contrast. There we go. Uh, this darker line is a line of dust and gas obscuring the starlight. So again, there are billions of stars in this galaxy, all so close to each other and so far away. We see their combined light as one big glow, even with a high-powered telescope. It just looks like a big uh, fuzzy glow. Uh, this object has another name. It is also known as Bode's Galaxy, or even before that, Bode's Nebula, uh, named after Johann Bode, who discovered this object in 1774. 
Uh, but back in 1774, he didn't really know what to make of this. Uh, he, he called it a nebula, which again just means cloudy thing. Uh, but now we don't call this a nebula anymore, we call it a galaxy to denote the fact that it is entirely separate from our own big concentration of stars, our Milky Way. There's lots of empty space between us and this separate galaxy, okay, just a big collection of stars. But located within the spiral arms, you can see brighter little uh, little dots uh, spattered, uh, scattered amongst it. And those are mostly star-forming regions, just like we saw with the Orion Nebula. We're just seeing that same kind of a thing in a different galaxy very far away, but they still show up as, as distinct little points of brighter regions in the spiral arms uh, where there are some uh, still some star formation going on in the galaxy. All right, so uh, again, this is Messier 81, and uh, if that name, Charles Messier, comes from a French astronomer who was looking for comets. And in his telescope, comets look like kind of fuzzy blobs. And of course, as you saw before, this, uh, before I took the long exposure, it looked kind of like a fuzzy blob. So you can see why it was mistaken for a comet. So Charles Messier uh, made a list of objects that weren't comets, but looked like they kind of were at first. Uh, and this was the 81st object on that list, uh, M81, Messier 81, uh, the 81st object to not look at in Charles Messier's mind, at least. Uh, but we're going to look at another not comet, the third not comet on Messier's list, M3, next. Um, so we're going to move the telescope again and head on over to M3. This is going to be a bigger move as well. And uh, let's see here. Uh, M3 is located low in the east at the moment. So you'll see the telescope slewing behind me. I know it looks like the telescope's going to hit me like it's really close, but it's actually, it's just bigger than it looks like on screen and it's further away than it looks. All right, so M3, again, is low in the east at the moment. And here it is on my map. Uh, this, this green line is the horizon of the dome. So that's the north star over there. Uh, so low in the east, it's rising now. Uh, so let's move the dome over so I'm not staring at the wall anymore. All right, so M3 is an example of a globular star cluster, a globular cluster. And globular clusters are enormous giant balls of ancient stars for the most part. We saw an open cluster of stars before uh, where there were about 500 stars there uh, and they were mostly kind of teenage stars, again, 250 million years old or so. Uh, but this time we're looking at something that's a lot more stars, uh, perhaps up to half a million stars in one cluster, which is about 33 or 34,000 light years away. So a lot closer than what we just looked at, which is an entirely different galaxy, a lot smaller too. This is within the bounds of our own galaxy, generally speaking. Uh, but uh, a lot more stars, some of the highest density of stars of any place within our galaxy, a whole bunch packed very closely together. All right, so what it's going to look like is, well, a giant ball of stars. So in the telescope, let's see here what we've got. And it's going to take that picture here in a quick second. Uh, we have, uh, well, it's a little faint. We can go a little longer exposure. It's probably not long enough. There we go. All right, starting to come out. There we go. All right, so this is kind of what it looks like in the uh, in the telescope with, with an eyepiece, just looking at it. Uh, it looks like, well, a, a smattering of stars very close to each other, uh, a lot uh, at the core, and then they kind of are, almost look like someone, I don't know, scattered dust or uh, salt grains on a table or maybe threw something on a wall and it kind of went splat. 
Um, but this is a, an, an example of a globular cluster, or globular, as some people say. It's a big ball. Uh, again, almost half a million stars, 500,000 stars, and it's about 190 light years in diameter. So very compact. And globular clusters such as this one are generally speaking, they're usually very old, uh, much older than the average star uh, it, that you would see uh, in, in most other places in our galaxy. Uh, it, this object is perhaps 12 billion years old. 12 billion years. Again, our sun is only 4.58 billion years old. And we think the universe itself is, is about 13.7 or 13.8 billion. Again, these, are, these stars are up to 12 billion years old. So they're really, really ancient. Uh, and gravity has just kept all these stars together for, for all these years. And maybe some stars have formed in that cluster since then, and some stars have died. But on average, they're, they're generally an older kind of star. Uh, so uh, we do actually have a tiny, thin cloud in the area at the moment. And again, this is live, but this is still refreshing. You can see it, new, new pictures loading over on the top left. But let's take a longer exposure now. Uh, this is only three seconds, 3.3 seconds. Again, that's kind of what it looks like in the telescope with the human eye. Let's go for, I don't know, 20 seconds, and that should be enough uh, to bring out a lot more detail. Uh, and again, there's a lot of stars packed in really close. All right, so a few more seconds, and uh, this picture will load. Five, four, three, two, one. There it goes. All right, look at them all. There's so many packed in so tight at the center, we can't even resolve them all. They just form a giant, big, glowing ball. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so dense at the center, it's almost hard to study these objects sometimes. Uh, the stars are so close to each other as they appear. Now, in reality, there's still lots of space between those stars, although they're closer than average stars in our galaxy. Uh, there's still lots of space. And again, it's it's sometimes easy to forget that this is a three-dimensional object. So I have another little animation here uh, showing kind of what a, what a globular cluster like this would look like uh, up close. And you see just packed tight with stars. Uh, incredibly, incredibly dense area. All right, so uh, this is the last object we have on our little sky tour tonight. Now, if you're still wanting more, don't worry. We do we do plan to offer uh, more of these events, more uh, tours like this, showing you other deep sky objects, as well as hopefully uh, another program uh, about the moon when the moon is up, uh, and even the sun, if at least if the sun decides to do something interesting uh, and worth looking at, uh, we'll take we'll do a program like this uh, live of looking at the sun. Um, so. The sky is a big place. Uh, if you if you want to see more things up there, uh, definitely tune tune back next time. We don't know exactly when we're going to offer this event again because it sort of depends on the weather uh, and some other things. Um, but uh, maybe at least once a week or so, we'll do this for the duration of that we're shut down. Uh, and uh, if you also want to rewatch this, this will remain on YouTube. You're welcome to to uh, come back here and rewatch it whenever you want. Uh, but if anyone has any questions for me, uh, I'll, I'm going to be answering them now. And uh, I have uh, some questions sent to me here. Uh, the first question is, uh, what do the red and purple marks on the map represent? Yeah, I'll go back to the map. I kind of skipped over that because uh, I didn't think it was too important. Um, but if I look at my map here, uh, this is telling me information about where the telescope can and can't point. Uh, basically, um, this is the middle part of the sky, and it can the telescope can aim here, but if you if you uh, but if you can't um, keep tracking there for too long, but we have to flip the mount around the telescope put on the other side of this pier, uh, so it doesn't run into itself essentially. So basically, it's telling me where where I can and can't uh, point the telescope. Nothing actually important about the sky, more about telescope operation. All right, another question I got. Can you provide a link for the 3D view of the Orion Nebula? Uh, I do not have that on hand. However, it is in the public domain. Uh, that was made by, I believe, a, a NASA Scientific Visualization Studio. And if you, I believe if you Google Orion Nebula Visualization or Animation, uh, that should come up. It almost, it's pretty easy to find because uh, it's, again, in the public domain. Uh, all right, another question I got, are any stars in M3 the size of our sun? 
Uh, most of the, the average star in M3 and, and most globular clusters like it in general uh, are smaller than our sun. Now, that's not to say that there weren't sun-like stars in that cluster, but I mentioned it's very old. And the bigger the star, the more massive the star is, the quicker it's going to die out uh, and run out of fuel, essentially. So most of the stars we saw in that cluster are smaller than the sun. Uh, however, some of them are, a few of them are, are larger or around the same size. The majority of them uh, are, are much smaller uh, than our sun. Another question I got, uh, are you an astronomer? Uh, I don't have a PhD in astronomy or anything. Uh, my, my job is mostly uh, focused on uh, public education and awareness, uh, as well as uh, uh, working on uh, light pollution issues or artificial lights at night. Uh, and uh, so essentially, we need the skies dark to do research here. So it's important that the surrounding area keep their lights dark. Uh, but also, there's, there are health concerns about using too many, too many artificial lights at night. Uh, and aiming a light straight up uh, doesn't help anybody. We're not, so I'm not against lights. Uh, I just uh, I think they should be used, used well, used, used smartly, essentially, intelligently. Uh, so I do I do help sometimes uh, astronomers with research projects. I have run our research telescopes, uh, but uh, but uh, I I'm more of a I work in the field of astronomy rather than actually being an astronomer. Another question: What sensor is your scope using, CMOS or CCD? Uh, this is a CMOS sensor, and I have the specs in the and the uh, the details in the. Uh, the description of this video, uh, but it is a CMOS sensor, uh, which was made by Panasonic. Um, was the uh, okay? Uh, what caused such a dense star cluster M3, and how far apart are they? Well, the actual formation of globular clusters is is a matter of a little bit of debate still in astronomy, and uh, they, we believe they form very early on in the early stages of the, the galaxy. Uh, why exactly globular clusters um, formed, whereas in some places not others, is, is actually not entirely understood. Uh, but we know that generally, uh, you know, stars form in big groups. If there's a big, if they form enough of them quickly enough. The gravitational ma the mass of all those stars so close to each other will keep them together in one big group. Uh, it may lose a few stars, but generally the gravity will keep it together. Whereas when we look at the open cluster, the, the gravity of all those stars is not enough to keep them together forever. They will eventually drift apart and floating off into space with their own unique trajectories. And how far apart are the stars in the cluster? Uh, in, a, a, in a square light year or so, you may get you may get two or three stars. Uh, so uh, they're, they're they're a lot closer than average, but uh, still, you're not too worried about the stars running into each other very often. Not to say that's impossible, uh, but there's still actually a, a lot of space in in, in between the stars. Uh, just on the grand scheme of things, they're relatively close. Uh, for reference, the sun to the next closest star, Proxima Centauri, is a little over four light years. Uh, whereas in this case, in, in one light year, you may get several stars. Uh, are stars unique like snowflakes? Hmm, good question. Uh, kind of, kind of. Uh, some things are pretty constant. Like if you know the mass of the star, you know how big it is, uh, then you know a lot about it. You can usually know how hot the star is probably from that uh, and, and more. Uh, but each star has tiny little differences uh, within them, maybe small chemical differences. Uh, and there's actually a research project uh, by an astronomer uh, here at McDonald Observatory or he's looking at the specific signatures, the chemical signatures of individual stars, uh, because he thinks that if stars form together, they should generally kind of like to have the same DNA, essentially, the same chemical elements and abundances in them. And even if they scatter apart over time, if we know uh, they kind of have the same signatures, even if they're far apart from each other, then they're probably related. They probably did form close to each other. Uh, so we can kind of we can kind of work backwards a little bit. Uh, how can we support the Dark Skies Initiative? That's a great question. Uh, there are a lot of organizations uh, uh, that are working on this. Uh, the International Dark Sky Association is one. Uh, and y you can read more about uh, what McDonald Observatory does on our website. Uh, you can go to our website under Learn. Um, but if you want to support the Dark Skies Initiative, what you can do is use dark sky friendly lighting. Uh, it's really easy. Uh, we have uh, guides on our website on how to do that. Essentially, we just ask that you use a, a shielded light so the light isn't aimed up. 
lights would be aimed down. And the general rule of thumb is that if you're off the property, you shouldn't be able to see the actual source of the light. So the light could be on the ground, you can see that, but you shouldn't see the bare light bulb if you're off the property. Uh, and we also uh, say that you should use lights that uh, are not too too blue in their con light content because blue light scatters more of the atmosphere uh, and creates more sky glow. Whereas red lights, like I'm using here, uh, more yellow lights uh, are easier on the eyes, easier on wildlife, and they don't contribute to light pollution as much. I mean, you can still see just fine in them. Uh, how long do you stay at the observatory? Do you sleep on site? Uh, yes, I do sleep on site. Uh, my house is on site. Uh, I, I don't leave. Uh, I haven't left, let's see, Couple couple weeks, I guess, since since we shut down. Um, yeah, well, McDonald Observatory is essentially its own little village, uh, and there are a, a few dozen uh, people and families living on site. And so, um, yeah, people literally stay on site. Uh, we have houses here. Uh, we're we're kind of our own little community. Uh, the make and model of the telescope. Uh, this is a uh, it's made by. Uh, RCOS, Richard Christian Optical Systems. It's a company that's not ma that's not around anymore. They mostly made research telescopes uh, or telescopes for universities uh, and sometimes for uh, you know, uh, other groups. Um, but uh, they they made they made research telescopes essentially. And uh, it is again a 16-inch F9 telescope uh, with carbon fiber tube, enclosed tube. Uh, Darkest was the darkest place in the United States. Uh, well, I guess that sort of depends. Um, I guess technically some places in the middle of Alaska are very dark, right? Uh, but that's not necessarily the best place to be uh, to be to build an observatory. Uh, you know, just because you're in the middle of nowhere, far from city lights, uh, doesn't mean you know the skies are clear to see the stars a lot. In Alaska, it's cloudy a lot, or it's too cold, uh, or like in Alaska, there's aurora, which actually will interfere with, you know, uh, night nighttime observations if you want to study stars. Uh, so the darkest place in the United States uh, uh, that is uh, that would be good for astronomy, at least, uh, would probably be in Big Bend National Park, just down south of us, uh, along the border with Mexico. It's a very remote area. They have they have very dark skies. Uh, we're new, we're not too far from there. Uh, as well as perhaps some places in, in Nevada, uh, kind of northern, uh, central Nevada. They're, they're pretty darn dark out, out there. Uh, what's the cost of a telescope? Well, um, this particular one, uh, you know, again, you can't buy it anymore because the manufacturer isn't around. But we're probably, if you were to buy it, this particular setup new, would be about sixty to seventy or eighty thousand dollars, depending on your options. You do not need a telescope like this good to have good views. Uh, a, a typical amateur telescope uh, for, for that's a, maybe a little smaller uh, would be run you about maybe uh, 300 uh, to $1,000, depending on how much you want to spend. I mean, you get what you pay for, essentially, uh, but a, a really good amateur telescope can be had uh, for under $500, at, you know, all with all the accessories included. Uh, but this this one's a little nicer, but you don't, you don't necessarily need that. Uh, all right, any other uh, questions? Did I miss anything? Uh, what is the back focus of the camera? Uh, I don't know. Uh, not a lot. It's pretty short focus, and I have a reducer on there. Um, I don't have that information on the top of my head. I have to look it up. Uh, another question. Uh, how how can we help sustain your programs, uh, or how are we funded? Uh, well, uh, we are a, a nonprofit. The visitor center uh, is is somewhat supported from the University of Texas, but but really we, we pay our, our public programs support the visitor center, uh, and and uh, that's mostly it. Um, but if you're interested in supporting us, uh, you, there is a link in the description. Uh, for support McDonald, you can join the Friends of McDonald. You get certain benefits for that. Uh, tickets, to, free tickets to star parties and other events. Uh, so yeah, thank, we thank you uh, for your contribution. We're, we're, we're uh, very thankful for anyone who, who wishes to support us. Okay, how are SpaceX sat Starlink satellites affecting uh, McDonald Observatory studies? Uh, well, um, 
it's been nothing good, I guess. Uh, so th for those unfamiliar, uh, Starlink is a satellite uh, constellation, essentially a whole bunch of satellites working together uh, that uh, SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk's uh, company, is launching. And these are communications satellites that are designed to uh, provide internet, especially especially to rural areas. And um, that's Starlink. Is I mean, I I, I see like. That's a good thing. I, I think we should be support supporting internet uh, connectivity for people who otherwise wouldn't have it, you know. But um, uh, the issue is that Starlink satellites are very reflective. They reflect a lot of sunlight, and that shows up uh, uh, in the sky as a bright rapidly moving point of light. And if there were just a few of these, it wouldn't be that big of a deal, right? There's already hundreds of thousands of satellites in orbit around the Earth. Uh, but the Starlink constellation of satellites will have many thousands uh, of satellites in low Earth orbit. Uh, and uh, I have seen them. They have kind of gotten in the way of a few exposures. Uh, and, and we are worried about it, especially for our, our Hobby Everly telescope, our uh, survey project. Uh, we're, we're, map, we're creating a huge map of the sky across a broad region to try to figure out why the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate the biggest project we have. Uh, but any any astronomy project that relies on surveying a huge area in the sky is going to be affected by all these satellites. Uh, and so uh, there, there are some efforts to try to address that, uh, like painting the satellites black, although we're not really sure how great that is because it's mostly the solar panels on the satellite that are reflecting the light, uh, as well as hopefully having just fewer satellites in general. Um, now, it's not going to prevent us from doing research entirely, but it, it does reduce the effectiveness of some of our observations. I know other observatories are going to be more effective than ours. Uh, it kind of depends on the research. Um, but yeah, it's something we're definitely keeping an eye on. Uh, have I ever seen a UFO? I've been asked that many times. Uh, no, I have not. I've been looking up my whole life, and uh, sadly, I've never seen anything uh, that that I, I would say is a UFO, uh, unless you're, I'm really, some people are really bad at identifying things, as, as Saul, my friend, likes to joke, and you know, anything you can't identify, I guess, is a UFO. Uh, I'm not paid by NASA to, you know, cover it up. Trust me, I don't make enough money to keep quiet about it, if, even if I, even if I uh, did see one. How long did it take to build the observatory? Uh, well, uh, our first telescope uh, we, we started construction on in uh, 1933, and we, we completed it in 1939. It was our first major telescope, our 82-inch. Uh, so that was uh, quite a few years, seven or so years, uh, six years or so. Uh, the next major telescope, our 107-inch Harlan J. Smith telescope, was completed very rapidly from 1966 to 1968. Uh, so that was uh, was also built during during uh, the space race. So there was a big uh, push to get it done quickly. And our Hobby Everly Telescope, our current largest telescope, uh, it took it took uh, six or seven years to complete it. It saw first light in 1997, uh, but it has since been uh, changed so much, so many upgrades over the years. It's it's almost a new telescope. So and in some sense, you know, the telescopes are never really done. They just kind of evolve. Uh, we 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 change the instruments. We keep them fresh. We keep them updated. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know how you can say really um, when they're really done. Uh, okay. Other current research at the observatory. Uh, well, we, we do we do lots of different things. Uh, I already talked a little bit about our 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 HETDEX project, our dark energy experiment, trying to measure the expansion of the universe, why the universe is expanding. It's probably our biggest project here. Uh, another interesting project we have is uh, we're looking for planets around stars uh, that are the right distance from that star for liquid water to exist. Called our, the, the instrument is called the Habitable Zone Planet Finder. Uh, and so we're essentially looking for, I mean, basically looking for aliens is what we really hope to see, uh, but really just looking more specifically at if these planets have the necessary preconditions for life as we know it. Uh, other research includes uh, we uh, the chemical compositions of stars uh, and trying to figure out where stars formed and how, in fact, the elements in the entire universe, how they got there. Uh, as well as 
uh, looking at comets, uh, we do a lot of comet research here, uh, looking at their compositions and uh, how, how uh, for the, uh, their orbits and, and other things. We've done uh, follow-up observations of near-Earth asteroids. Uh, we've done a lot of things. Every every week, there's usually a, an entirely new project going on. Some some astronomers here doing something, uh, then the, then they another astronomer takes their place. Now, at the moment, they're not actually coming here. Uh, we're, we're collecting the data and sending it to them. But generally speaking, every week, there's a new new project going on. Okay, uh, I've got time for maybe one more question. Uh, let's see here. Uh, did you all participate in putting together the recent Cosmos episode uh, about Gerard Kuiper? Uh, so, yeah, they, they came... Uh, Cosmos, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, they came here, oh, geez, what was that, 2017, I think? 2018? It was a while back that they actually filmed things uh, here uh, for the episode that aired uh, Cosmos just a few weeks ago. Um, so they, we kind of just made sure that they were able to, to get the shots they want, uh, made, sure, made sure that the telescopes were positioned for them and everything. Uh, I don't think any of our staff members were actually on camera. Uh, we were mostly just uh, some of us some of the staff members here were making sure that they uh, uh, got the footage they want and also provided historical information and stuff to them. All right, so uh, that's going to conclude uh, the, our program for tonight. Uh, thank you all so much for joining me on this. Again, we do hope to do more of these. Uh, and uh, we, we love the questions. We're, we may also do a, a Q&A session where we answer more of your questions. Uh, if When things do improve uh, in, in the future, when it's safe, I definitely encourage you to come on out here. You'll get to look through this telescope and others at the star party, see the real night sky as it really is, not just on a computer screen. Uh, but hopefully you enjoyed this program. Uh, thank you all so much again. Uh, this has been lovely. This has been a lot of fun. I just love looking at, up at the sky, so I'd, I'll take any excuse to do that. Uh, uh, see you all later, and look look for uh, future events on our on our uh, social media. We'll post it there if we can do more of these events. I'm going to be all new targets. All right, take care, y'all. Clear skies, everyone. <laughs>